Hey everyone, welcome to the most opinionated space podcast on the internet. Ad Astra, Astra, the podcast where we talk about the intersection between space, policy, and technology. I'm Jack, your resident space policy advocate. And I'm Newton. I'm your guy for space technology. All right, before we get started for today, a few housekeeping items. So the first thing on our to-do list is remind you about the t-shirts. You can still pick up your Ad Astra official t-shirt at elemental.fm slash Ad Astra shirt. That's elemental.fm slash Ad Astra shirt. The other housekeeping item is I've been following closely the potential for a government shutdown, and uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Right, Newton? <laughs> Who would have predicted that? <laughs> <laughs> we did. We predicted it. Um, so so as far as what we're getting into today, we ha- we are actually sitting here with the Celeste research team. And before we get started, just to give them a quick introduction, the Celeste research team spent three years developing and testing a new parallel computing method that was used to process the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data set and produce the most accurate catalog of 188 million astronomical objects in just 14.6 minutes with state-of-the-art point and uncertainty estimates. Celeste Project is a collaboration between MIT, UC Berkeley, Harvard, Julia Computing, Intel, and NERSC, which is the DOE Supercomputing Center. Uh, as Newton said, you know, 188 million stars and galaxies in just under 15 minutes. Uh, the system will be highly utilized uh, by future astronomers and astronomical researchers once the LSST and James Webb Space Telescope come online. So let's start on our list. Kino, if you want to start off with your introduction, we can go on to Prabhat. Yeah, thanks, Jack, for having us. So my name is Kino Fisher. I'm CTO for Developer Tools at Julia Computing. Uh, Julia Computing is the company devoted to the development of the Julia programming language. And one thing the Celeste collaboration made heavy use of is the Julia programming language to be able to develop this very new method and get it running on one of the fastest computers in the world while simultaneously retaining the flexibility to make changes and to apply this very new method to this giant data set. Awesome. And where are you based out of? I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Great. So part of the, uh, I guess, academic side of the team at MIT? So the Julia project came out of MIT, but I'm now at the company Julia Computing that we co-founded about uh, about three years ago now to take what was on the academic side, the Julia programming language, and sort of turn it into a commercial enterprise to get some, uh, to be able to con- continue developing the language sort of without uh, requiring grant grants from the academic side or finding some excuse to work on it, um, but rather focusing on the language itself and trying to sustain it on its own. Great. And then Prabhat? Yeah, well, again, uh, Jack and Newton, thanks very much for uh, inviting us today. So I'm, I'm Prabhat. I lead the data and analytics services team at NERSC. Uh, NERSC is Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Supercomputing Center. Uh, we support over 7,000 users uh, across a number of different domain science areas. For this particular project, uh, the Celeste project, I am the, the PI for the uh, Applied Math uh, grant that, that funded the, this particular project. And again, I've been uh, quite privileged, I would say, to help in coordinating the interactions within our uh, research teams uh, and and just making sure that uh, you know we, we executed on uh, on this project great so i guess going into the first question for both of you what i know we've we've already described what celeste is capable of with in terms of astronomical data but what is i guess what is the the core of what you're you guys were trying to do with this project, was it a tech demonstration? Was it a uh, was there a yeah? I know you said not grants, but was there a, a contract associated with it, or sort of where does this fall on the spectrum of why you do things? Yeah, so this is definitely a, a research project. So um, you know, it started off in the applied math program in the Department of Energy. Uh, we wrote a grant proposal, uh, which was around uh, developing advanced statistical methods for processing modern uh, scientific data. So in this case, it's astronomy data. And um, uh, over the last three years, again, we've been systematically developing uh, advanced statistical methods to run uh, inference. Originally, this this project started off with a physicist, an astronomer in particular, David Schlegel, who is in the Berkeley Lab Physics Division. And he reached out to me uh, during a, a picnic that, uh, you know, our kids' uh, school had, had arranged. And uh, he pitched this problem to me. If he could provide you know, all the telescope data there is in the world could be uh, the computer scientists 
process all of that data and uh, create one unified list of all objects in the sky that we can observe, that is. So that sounded like a fascinating project to me. Uh, I, th I think the way David explained it was fairly straightforward in that if you look up at the sky, uh, you know, over the course of our lifetimes, the sky really doesn't change that much. Um, but every single telescope that comes in, uh, you know, they, they go about acquiring the data, storing the data, and then when the time comes to do the analysis, they pretend as if no one's ever looked at the sky before. Um, so wouldn't it be great if uh, historical sky surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, but then also um, other surveys which are going to come about, you mentioned the LSST and the James Webb Telescope, wouldn't it be great if we can pool all of that data and run the analysis across uh, all, all of these data sets? Now, it so, so happens that NERSC uh, being a, a flagship supercomputing center for the DOE has a lot of this data on hand. So essentially in this particular project, which is definitely, I would say, a research exercise, but we are hoping to transition it to production in, in the near future. We got our hands on all of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data, and then we went about uh, doing the research, developing the methods, and then implementing them at scale. Great. Wow. So, so I mean, there's a lot to really dive into in terms of that explanation. One thing that strikes me with uh, as far as far as pulling in new data, um, how how have you guys gone about making making whatever method that you have sort of extendable so that you can pull in new and and I'm assuming diverse data if you're talking about pulling in other digital sky surveys. Can you speak a little bit more to sort of the data architecture that you guys are, uh, without giving too much away, obviously? <laughs> yeah, so maybe Keno can, can fill in more on the specifics of how Julia goes about loading the data, but maybe speaking from the nurse perspective, often uh, you know, astronomers will decide on a certain data format for storing images. So in this case, uh, we were dealing with FITS files. Uh, we are trying to get astronomers to look at other file formats such as HDA5 and so on in, in the future. Now, in this case, uh, we had a lot of FITS files to deal with. And uh, as long as, again, astronomers have uh, used standard metadata schema conventions for how they're gonna be storing images and any any other metadata tags corresponding to uh, perhaps the noise level or uh, any, any other artifacts corresponding to uh, scans that are taken, then one can write, I think, fairly generic code in Julia, or for that matter, any other programming language, to load up the metadata, understand what's in the tags, and then go about doing the actual I/O. By the way, by the way, listeners, that's fits. Uh, it's a it's it's a format for storing for for basically storing image data, large, large scale image data. It's called the Flexible Image Transport System. It's sort of an open standard for large scale storage. Just for for our listeners who are unfamiliar with <laughs> with FITS data. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, thanks, Dayton. We're going to try hard not to use too many acronyms today, but thanks for. No worries, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> So is it like JPEG, right? Yeah, that's right. You can think of it as JPEG for the strong. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So let me let me jump in on that question as well. So one of the things that's really great about the Celeste collaboration is that all of the code is available on the internet. It's on GitHub. You can look at it. It's sort of a standard Julia package. So if you have Julia installed, you can just type package add Celeste and get all of the code that we use to perform this analysis. Now, obviously, if you wanted to do an analysis over the entire data set, you'd have to have a supercomputer. But you can certainly take a small subset of the data, reproduce the method, you know, find, um, find out how it works, play with it, see if it works for your use case. And since it is open, you know, we don't have to be necessarily even the ones to extend it. And if you have a new data set, you can try using the same method, using the same code on that new data set. If you have a new application for sort of a similar technique, so Celeste, uh, as we used it, extracted certain parameters from the data set, but astronomers or other people might be interested in other aspects of the data set, and they might be able to use the same technique. So the code is all open. It's on the internet. Yeah, you can just you can just download it. Yeah, that's a great great point, Keno. And uh, so going back maybe to the data architecture question. In this case, I think our architecture is fairly straightforward in that it is a flat, you know, collections of files. Um, things are going to be somewhat more complicated uh, with the LSST. Uh, they will have a, a database. Uh, uh, that will essentially be responsible for storing and managing the data. Uh, even in that case, I would say that it should be, as, as Kero pointed out, 
uh, it should be possible for someone to come in and uh, uh, make you know issue queries essentially uh, to pull out the metadata corresponding to re- the region of the sky that they want to process and then pull in the actual uh, imaging or or maybe even uh, spectroscopic data sets. So I would say that um, while the data architecture was fairly straightforward for Celeste this time around, extending it to other uh, data schemas or, or layouts in the future uh, should also be possible. Oh. Well, it's yeah, and it's great that you guys made it that way, and it's nice and open source. People can add to it. That no, that's wonderful. As far as but let, let's let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the a little bit more about the Julia computing language. You know, I'd only recently heard of Julia, probably about a year or so ago. Um, I know it's a high level, high performance dynamic programming language for numerical computing. But, you know, do you want to dive a little bit more into that? What makes Julia so special and, and really is makes it the optimal uh, language for, for this mission? Right, absolutely. So the standard way we tend to pitch it is that if you look at the history of programming language, you can generally identify two camps of programming language. On the one hand, you have your high-performance programming languages, your C, C++, Fortran, you know, what have you. And on the other hand, you have sort of the high productivity programming languages, languages that the scientists and the end users like to use, say your R if you're doing statistics, your Python. Right, Python, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, your Bash if you happen, you know, if you're doing shell scripting. So, you know, the research impetus for Julia was, you know, why is this and can we create one system that is both. That is, you know, to the performance freaks who need to get the absolute most performance, you know, have enough power to provide that, but to the user present the friendly interface that they're used to and the abstractions that they rely on in order to quickly prototype new methods. So, so these are like friendly C libraries <laughs> then. Uh, it's no, it's not a C library. It's sort of it's so the thing about Julia is that you can have Julia all the way down. So if you look at the architecture of, say, you know, your standard Python library, what you'll have is you'll have a bunch of heavy lifting libraries written in C because they need high performance because they process, you know, raw imaging data, for example. And then you'll have a thin or not so thin layer of Python that makes the C palatable. Right. Right, because nobody wants to write directly in C, you know, the... If you make a mistake in C, your program crashes, you don't get nice error messages. Debugging is hard, you sort of have to recompile your program, you can't just sit at a REPL. Julia tries to have all of that, the nice interfaces, the nice, you know, having a REPL, but simultaneously there's no point at which you have to drop down to C for performance reasons. So one of the things that I really like about Celeste is that it's really Julia all the way down. So when we ran on the supercomputer, you know, about 40% of the time was um, just in the pure Julia computational kernels. Now, we had to do a bunch of image loading, and there was some, you know, overhead in the C library, but it was really mostly code written entirely purely in Julia that was delivering this performance. And that is one of the aspects that makes me really excited about the Celeste project. So a question that I'm sort of as as a non-technical person, I have no background in computer science or physics. Uh, I'm purely policy guy here. What would be the difference then if, say, the Celeste project was not run all the way down in Julia? Like we were saying, 188 million stars and galaxies, things in the night sky and day sky in 14 minutes. What's the alternative? Right, so the standard way that people would architect this is that they would have this architecture generally that I described, which is you have your high performance parts in a high performance language and sort of your user interface parts in a high productivity language. And one of the things, one of the problems that this causes is what's known as the two language problem for obvious reasons. But I actually think that the, that the effects of this two language dichotomy are not always obvious because I think it's mostly a social problem. So what happens is that a scientist says, okay, this is the algorithm I wanna try. You know, this is the new method I just thought of. This is the cool new thing you know, we think will help us in our research. 
But the scientists are generally not the performance gurus that know how to write this code in these high performance languages. So they'll generally say, okay, here's the algorithm, they'll prototype it in one of these high productivity languages, and then they'll throw it over the fence to a programmer or you know, if it's better funded, a team of programmers and say, okay, recode this so that it runs fast and can process all the data. And you know, this causes obvious problems. On the one hand, you know, it takes three months to rewrite, but on the other hand, you know, you lose the communication between the two sides, between the people who know about the science and the people who know about the performance. So what we found during the Celeste project was that even as you know, I and the other computer scientists on the team who were really trying to tune the performance were making those changes, you know, the science was still ongoing. There were this, you know, new ideas about what to try, the science parts were being rewritten, and we were really operating on the same code base, rather having this linear, pro uh, this linear process where you know, the scientists came up with a prototype and then threw it over the, over the fence to the computer scientists to actually turn it into a real thing. And I think this collaboration between these two sides is something enabled by everybody speaking the same language, and I think that is very powerful. So I think the iter just to add to that, the, the iteration process becomes much faster. So uh, as the statisticians or the scientists have um, more ideas about what they might, might want to tweak in this statistical model or have it do the right thing st statistically, um, they don't have to wait for many, many months for you know some computer scientists to come in and help them out. It's, you're working on the same code base, you're working on the same language. Uh, the iteration is much faster. Also, maybe you know I'll, I'll interpret uh, your question, Jack, in, in two ways. One is why do it in Julia, and then why do it at scale? Uh, you know what's the big deal in running it in 15 minutes? Um, so right now, um, uh, of course, scientists do try to uh, run analytics on tens of terabytes, sometimes hundreds of terabytes of data. And it takes them three months uh, or maybe more uh, to essentially do that analysis. Now, think about the LSST regime, wherein you'll have that much data coming in every single night. Uh, so there's going to be a big, you know, if you, if you do not um, plan it out, if you do not plan out your infrastructure, both for storing, storing managing, and analyzing the data, uh, you're just going to keep piling on the data in some repository somewhere that uh, hopefully you're going to get to at some point and, and do the analysis. But now if you have this capability, again, thanks to Julia and, and the supercomputing center uh, to do the analytics on the entire data set in 15 minutes, it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of trying out the latest and greatest uh, statistical models. Otherwise, essentially, I think what tends to happen sociologically is that people tend to make compromises. They'll choose a simpler statistical model or they choose something which um, they know is going to be safe to run, uh, may not be as, as fancy, may not be as accurate potentially. But they'll just, they're just going to make those trade-offs in their minds as opposed to running that uh, you know, in, in practice on a, on a supercomputing platform. And so, you know, when, when, when you're mentioning this, the social problem, right, of not being able to communicate, that sounds very familiar to stuff that we deal with in the policy realm of there's all the science that's going on, there's all of these projects that are being worked on. How do you communicate that to the layperson? How do you communicate that to a congressional office or the, an administrative office within the executive branch? So what, I guess, what's your, what's the, the 30 second, what's the elevator pitch for, you know, the further development of this collaboration or further development of this research and Julia for maybe problems that exist in the policy sphere? Yeah, so one aspect which we've seen not necessarily in science at the moment, but in some of our industrial customers, is that code that's written in Julia tends to be simpler to understand, even if it is high-performance code. So it's usually a lot easier to explain what's going on. So some of our customers in, say, the financial industry have liked this property because it makes it easy to explain to their regulators, okay, this is, you know, this is what we're doing. So I feel like, uh, and simultaneously, as a high-level programming language, we have um, sort of a lot of interactive tools for exploring, you know, data sets, you know, making, making fancy plots and, you know, scrolling around in your data set and changing parameters. So I feel like from the policy perspective, making code more accessible 
might help explain what the actual science that's going on is better rather than some obtuse code somewhere on the side and then saying, okay, this is you know, what we're doing, but it's hidden and you can't look at it and nobody can understand it you know, except the, the guru sitting over there in his cubicle who wrote it. Right. Overall, it's better for extending the code base as well. I think that's a big, a, a big portion of this. Not just, not, it, it's not necessarily just about, you know, the, the layperson going through your code and, and understanding it. It's really just the other, the, the next person down the line who wants to pick up that code base doesn't have to go and talk to that guru, I think is one of, is one of the bigger, um, payoffs that you get that you get from something like this yeah collaboration is certainly a big one i mean celeste is certainly intended to be a tool for the astronomical community at large and you know it is developed in that way for a reason so it is developed as i mentioned as an open source package there's documentation you know everything that happens on the celeste repository is public anybody can take the code they can come to us they can file issues they can say hey, I didn't understand how that worked, and they can contribute back code. And, you know, that's not really uh, special to Celeste. The entire Julia community as a whole works that way. So Julia itself is open source. You know, we get contributions from literally thousands of people, whether in science or in industry, who, you know, either say, hey, this didn't work for me. Can you fix it? Or they say, hey, it worked great, but here's something I came up with that I want to share with everybody else. So can you just put it into the system so everybody else can have access to it? And I think this collaboration is certainly very powerful. I was going to say that that open source aspect of it probably makes it more, creates almost a buy-in for people to to help solve problems as opposed to, oh, they're doing all this in a back room somewhere. I don't understand what's going on. I can't see the code. And even if I can see the code, I, you know, don't understand the logic along the way. So what does the community then look like? You're saying thousands of people contribute to the Julia language. How has that, I guess, been involved in this process in terms of Celeste? Has has there been outside help beyond the collaboration we just described? Or is it sort of all that was building up to what Celeste is? Yeah, so I think there's, I think there's several aspects here. So the first one is that Celeste was able to reuse a lot of the infrastructure that is available in the general community. I mean, at the very basic, you know, the Julia programming language itself, which is built through this process, but there's, you know, many, many packages of Julia code that solve specific problems that the Celeste collaboration was able to reuse without having, you know, to solve the same problems that say, you know, the biostatisticians had to solve when they wrote, you know, that specific package. So on the one hand, we were able to reuse all of that work from the community. On the other hand, the community sets sort of norms and standards for how the code is organized and provides tools for code organized in this fashion. So Celeste is organized as a Julia package. So anybody that knows how to use Julia will automatically know how to install Celeste, how to use it, sort of what the tools uh, available are to work with that code base. And it sort of embeds Celeste in a larger community of researchers um, and other people using the software that are all familiar with the way that things work. Science at work. <laughs> so, so we've gotten into we, we've talked a lot about um, the, sort of the things that Julia enables Celeste to do. But let's dive a little bit more into what is what Celeste is actually doing. So we know that we know that it's you know you guys are using you're you're trying to build this fully generative model to mathematically locate and characterize light sources in in the night sky, and you're implementing a host of statistical inference methods to do that. Um, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more to, uh, you know, things like what, to what level of granularity are you trying to characterize light sources in the night sky? Um, to what extent can scientists take the model that you're generating and then, you know, go forward with further inspection of particular parts of the night sky, things like that. Talk, speaking a little bit to, more to, you know, what kind of data processing are you doing and how, and, and you know, how is that benefiting other scientists who want to use your model? 
Yeah, sure. So maybe I can I can start with this statist- statistical model. So I'll quickly first acknowledge that uh, our collaborators at UC Berkeley, Jeff Regier, John McAuliffe, and at Harvard, Ryan Adams, are really the ones who've developed this uh, statistical model to begin with. Um, so uh, essentially, this is, to the best of my knowledge, the, the largest uh, graphical model in science. Um, we essentially parameterize stars and galaxies by a few key quantities. So uh, say in the case of a star, it may be its uh, position in the sky, its its brightness, temperature. For a galaxy, apart from its position and, and brightness, uh, you might have parameters corresponding to the type of the galaxy. And uh, if it's an ellipse, uh, characteristics pertaining to you know how oblique it is and so forth. So, um, uh, and then essentially what we do is to model the conditional relationships between these parameters and how uh, an idealized point in the sky that's at a certain position and of a certain brightness will result in a certain pixel count, uh, I'm sorry, in a certain photon count on your CCD sensors. So as you think about the process by which a photon might travel uh, from this light, this idealized point source to a CCD sensor, uh, you have to take the point spread function of the atmosphere into account. Um, you have to take your... Uh, artifacts corresponding to uh, to your instrument into account. And, and some of these artifacts uh, might change over time, so you might need to model those as well. So essentially, it becomes a, a big deconvolution problem in some sense. Um, uh, you get a spread of photons uh, on, on a grid, but now you, you have to essentially invert that spread and uh, remove out the nuisance parameters corresponding to these point spread functions uh, and recover the true estimates for uh, a star's location and its brightness and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, all of these, uh, you know, this this description of, you know, the, this essentially graphical model and all of its conditional relationships can be formalized uh, uh, through a generative model. And that's exactly what uh, Jeff Regier and, and uh, John McAuliffe and Ryan Adams have done in collaboration with David Schlegel in, in the physics division here. They've had David sign off on every single choice of uh, <laughs> the uh, hyperparameter family, the, the functional form of the relationship, and so on and so forth. So we know that uh, from a physics perspective, the model should be doing the right thing. Uh, once the, the model has been signed off on, then essentially uh, the statisticians then uh, write code that will essentially implement the inference procedure. So now that I have a great graphical model, uh, all I have are observations. So now I use Bayes' rule to do the inversion. Are you using a naive Bayes as far as your generative model? Uh, no. So this is a, a fairly uh, sophisticated model with a lot of parameters. Uh, okay, that's uh, what I thought. <laughs> yes, at, at this scale, yeah. again, corresponding to the 188 million objects, uh, you need to essentially invert about, uh, you need to determine around 8 billion parameters. Um, so there are very few schemes that actually work at this scale. Uh, the two schemes that we think work at this scale are uh, variational inference, and in particular stochastic variational inference, and MCMC. So the UC Berkeley team uh, was you know, pushing on the variational inference uh, side of things, and then Ryan Adams and his team from Harvard were pushing on the MCMC uh, side. So um, uh, again, um, uh, you know, getting variational inference to work at this scale has, is unheard of. Um, so one of the methodological innovations here, uh, or rather the accomplishment, is that uh, in the process of inverting eight, 8 billion parameters, we've proved that variational inference can now work on four orders or more uh, magnitude more data and parameters compared to whatever the existing uh, application was. So this is the largest scale demonstration of variation inference uh, compared to anything else. How much do you think vari- variational infer- inference contributed to the speed at which you're able to generate the model in comparison to the, the language that you're using itself, like Julia computing and all of that? So you mean to say if uh, we had variational inference implemented in Julia versus, say, MCMC in Julia, how much of a performance difference we might observe? Is that the question? Uh, no, more like if you had variational inference um, implemented in another language versus Versus uh, in Julia, hmm. you, I, I'm trying to get I'm trying to get a sense of the language's contribution to this versus the algorithmic side of it. Yeah, you know that's a good question. I, I unfortunately don't have information on hand uh, on what that reference implementation, say either in C or Python, mm-hmm. would be compared to Julia. Um, uh, you know, almost for sure. And again, this was a question back to the 
earlier discussion that we were having regarding productivity, uh, almost for sure, you know, had we chosen to implement this in C or some other lower level language, um, we would have lost the flexibility to keep changing this generative model, this graphical model. So as we are exploring various uh, parameterizations and conditional relationships, it would take us much, much longer for every iteration of the of the graphical model. Sure. So I think we would have certainly lost that. Uh, Keno, would you have heard of any other uh, folks doing variational inference in Julia and maybe uh, a baseline compared to some other language? Yeah, so I'm not aware of uh, numbers in that regard, but one point I want to make is that you know Julia is net not generally faster than high performance programming languages. So uh, we tend to say that a well implemented Julia program is has the same performance as you know a well implemented C or C plus plus program. But the point is really mm -hmm. about the trade off between performance and productivity. So if you were to implement your problem in C or C++, you know, you would get great performance, but it would take you a very long time. If you were to implement your problem purely in, you know, Python or R without using any C libraries, you know, you might get there pretty quickly about right. the you know, same speed or maybe even faster since you're not going for performance than if you're writing it in Julia. But, you know, you wouldn't have the performance at all and you couldn't reach the scale. Right, so processing would take we, a long time, yes. Right, so the, the thing we try to go for in Julia is that, you know, you can prototype your thing quickly, just as quickly as you would in a high productivity language, and then it should have decent performance. And then, you know, at that point, traditionally, you'd have to go and rewrite it. But what we try to do is say, okay, you know, here's the tools for figuring out why the performance isn't there yet. And mm -hmm. then, you know, it should take you maybe a week or two to tune it for really high performance on, you know, whatever computing system you're targeting. So it doesn't completely eliminate the work of making it go fast. You know, there's some tricks there and some, some ways to make it go fast, but it's all in the same language and we provide tools to do it and the scientists can still read the resulting code. So it's really about this trade-off. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, going back perhaps, you know, to put it simply, you know, it does it it does allow you to um, extend the amount of parameters um, that, that your model is able to take and extend, which which eventually um, extends to you being able to, in a more practical sense, pull in more data, more diverse data. Going back to that original question um, from a while ago, that's right. So I think once you have a rich, flexible statistical model and an associated inference procedure implemented in a language like Julia. Uh, you can apply that um, to a large data set, a diverse data set. And now, uh, by virtue of it running effectively on a supercomputer, uh, the turnaround time can be you know, tens of minutes on tens of terabytes of data, which is simply not possible on, say, a, a laptop. And and not to not to you know check your work or anything, but did you guys did had, had anyone tried doing sort of a prototype MCMC? Uh, model when you when when you originally started this project? Oh, definitely. So again, uh, the the Harvard group uh, is in charge of the MCMC implementation, and uh, again, you know, from a statistics perspective, it's uh, known that variational inference is uh, is biased, and MCMC is really you know the right thing to do if you can get it to work at scale. There are other challenges associated with getting MCMC to scale and getting it to do the right thing. Right, it's typically meant for smaller data sets. That's right. So so yeah. the scaling challenge, I would say, is is common to both variational inference and MCMC. Uh, and, and MCMC has a few more things that uh, you have to get right, having to do with uh, mixing and, and getting the uh, the chains to converge and so on and so forth. So, uh, so now, yes, we are, in fact, following up on this uh, sure. accomplishment in terms of scaling. Sure. Uh, we are about to submit a, a paper to a statistical journal which does uh, apples to apples comparison between variational inference and MCMC for a, a part of the sky known as Stripe 82, for hmm. which we have some really good quality data. And uh, uh, and yeah, I mean, so I think we have a, a good sense for, you know, what the bias might be in the uh, variational inference estimates and, and so on. Very cool. Very cool. So as far as milestones down the road, let's let's talk let's let's talk a little bit about that. Sort of what's the what's the next miles? What are the next set of milestones that Celeste is trying to hit 
um, aside from, you know, proving for, you know, obviously what you want to continue um, proving why your, why your model is appropriate for doing this kind of survey, but, you know, going forward, you know, what, mm-hmm. what, what's sort of your, you know, not to, not to take, not to take um, a, the language from the Hallmeyer questions, what are your midterm and final exams for, <laughs> for, uh, for uh, the Celeste project going forward? Sure. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I think we we had a, a major accomplishment, really, I think this year in terms of getting the Celeste code base to scale. So I think we're really pleased about that. Um, the uh, the paper that I mentioned to you regarding a head-to-head comparison between variational inference and MCMC is now ready, so that's headed out as well. The next step uh, really is around this vision of incorporating multiple data sets. So the, uh, the run that we did was processing the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data only, but we really want to incorporate a, a different data set. So we have a few options in mind at NERSC. Uh, we have uh, the decals data set and a few other uh, next generation data sets which are uh, going to be available. So we have been refactoring the code so that we can more easily ingest and account for the diversity uh, of, of these different data sets. Because every time you switch data sets, there's always odd things, right? Sure. So the uh, the artifacts might be different. Um, the properties of the instrument might be, might be different, um, so on and so forth. So that's going to be, I think, the next big uh, milestone for us. Uh, you know, how do you uh, account for two different data sets and then, okay. uh, more importantly, prove that what you can do by processing two data sets simultaneously is better than what you could have done by processing SDSS independently and decals independently. Sure. So that, that notion of... Um, joint inference across multiple data sets, I think is a, is a next big milestone uh, that we're looking forward to. Uh, down the line, obviously. Right, you might, run into, you might run into struggles with proof of correctness. I mean, are you going to sort of weigh it against another model that has already brought together two data sets? You know, so yeah, so I mean, there is, there is a, a, I think a general question around what is the ground truth? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, the ground truth, not the right word to use here in this context, but wh- wh- where is the, the gold standard, right? Where is that coming from? So uh, essentially, um, you can use the Hubble. Uh, you can use the Hubble Space oh, Telescope no. as, yeah. as the ground truth. So choose a part of the sky that has been imaged uh, repeatedly by the Hubble. And then... Um, Uh, Because it doesn't suffer from uh, a lot of artifacts having to do with uh, uh, ground-based telescopes, uh, you should be able to, in theory, get uh, get better results using the Hubble. So that can serve as a uh, as a check. So yeah, so that's, you know, that's the, the plan again, but that can only be done for some parts of the sky, which, which have been imaged by the Hubble. But it does give you some sense of a quote unquote yeah. ground truth to base your, right. to base your claims off of. Okay. I like that that's approach. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, so going back to the, the midterm and the finals question. So, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, uh, apart from doing, uh, inference, joint inference across multiple telescopes, um, there are many bells and whistles that we have in mind in terms of improving the statistical model. There's, you know, there's never any end to it, I guess. You know, that's what keeps the statisticians in business, I guess. Um, <laughs> so a number of innovations in terms of uh, the point spread function and how do you better model galaxies. Uh, it, it turns out that um, in contrast to stars, uh, galaxies turn out to be fairly hard to model parametrically. So hmm. we have plans in, in hand for uh, using deep learning, uh, using autoencoder models to... Uh, uh, to model shapes of galaxies. And again, I think our preliminary results seem to indicate that that should work better than uh, than what's happened in the past. Now, uh, David Schlegel, who's the resident scientist, the, the resident astronomer on the team, uh, he's interested in uh, a, ta- a temporal version of Celeste. So right now, hmm. we assume that the sky is static, but uh, of course, in uh, that's not strictly true. Um, right. So you can uh, essentially repurpose Celeste uh, to look at objects in the solar system. So you can look for, uh, uh, you know, Planet X, or you can look for asteroids. You can look for uh, uh, asteroids that might be on a collision course towards the Earth. Um, uh, out of the solar system, you can look at uh, transient objects. So, of course, supernovas being a classic example, uh, but uh, potential uh, candidates for for, uh, for life. Um, so... Uh, uh, so the, there is a the, the statistical model right now, which works on static uh, images, uh, can certainly incorporate time uh, in, uh, and, and take that into account. I'm, I'm certainly going to be very interested in um, in the dynamics of it all when, um, <laughs> when at this, for something at that scale, dealing with the transients yeah, at, right. at that level should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
So I guess the the extreme that you can take that transience would be tracking near Earth objects. Absolutely. Right? The, yes. the, I guess the closer you get to Earth, the the I guess better resolution you can get, but the more difficult it is to keep up. So where would mm-hmm. I? Because I'm I'm looking at some of the case studies that Julia puts out, and one of them is the Safer Skies about tracking the thousands, you know, tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of aircraft that fly around the Earth to make sure you know collisions don't happen. What about space traffic management? That's an issue that we've covered on the show before and that has been a personal interest of mine is that sort of space situational awareness. How do we make sure that satellite X is not going to collide with, you know, nuts and bolts that are up there? I mean, because we can only track so many at at such a certain resolution, but would utilizing something like Julia um, and some of the technology behind the Celeste project help in that? project? You know, certainly, I, I think, you know, one could extend it. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, cautiously note that that's somewhat out of the purview of the Department of Energy. <laughs> so, so I think, uh, you know, we... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right. There, there are folks uh, in the Air Force who do that. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yes. Precisely. Yes. So, uh, so, you know, we, um, uh, we have a very strong background in cosmology. Uh, you know, we are known for Nobel Prizes in in the cosmic microwave background and and the large scale evolution of of, of the universe, uh, so both Saul Perlmutter and George Smoot have Nobel prizes in that space. Uh, folks like uh, David Schlegel uh, are maybe uh, oddities in that they they look at the solar system and they look at uh, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but um, yeah, unfortunately, I think in terms of um, uh, you know, uh, tracking objects, I guess, uh, in, in orbit, I think that's that's somewhat out of our purview. But uh, that having been said, obviously, from a statistical perspective, um, you can customize the graphical model to take uh, such objects into account. Um, and, uh, and, and chances are high that you'll need to add in known priors for the dynamics of such objects and... Uh, uh, getting access to the relevant data set because again, uh, you know, we, we at this point in time we don't have uh, in the DOE have access to such data sets. But I'm sure that I was going to say that's always difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's probably uh, locked up tight in a vault. Well, yeah. you can uh, you can get <laughs> access, but the, yeah, requests will have to be will have to be made for very good reasons. Yeah, uh. let me come at this from a slightly different perspective briefly, though, which is that you mentioned the uh, safest uh, skies case study. And just to give some background on that, so this is an FAA project for the next generation aircraft collision avoidance system, ACAS-X. And what this system is, is it's it's a system that's actually on the aircraft itself and takes in some sensor input and and monitors the environment and gives an advisory to the pilot, you know, climb, 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 you're you're about to fly into another plane. But the the use of Julia in that particular case study is actually very interesting because they're they're using Julia as a specification language. So ACAS is an algorithm that goes on the airplane, but in the past, the description of this algorithm, and this algorithm every aircraft manufacturer has to incorporate into their system, but the description of this algorithm in the past used to be a sort of English text. So what the, um, what the people working on the ACAS-X project decided was that for the next generation, they were going to have an executable specification. So a specification that you know, they could test by actually executing the specification to make sure that you know, the plans they came up with for what, they, uh, what the model should spit out actually matches what is written in the specification. Um, and then giving that to all the aircraft manufacturers so there, there wouldn't be sense. any um, doubts about what the spe- specification actually meant because that was a, a problem in the past. So I think that aspect of it might be interesting uh, for spaceflight, you know, maybe not in the immediate future, but sort of further down the road. You know, we're seeing more commercial activity in space. And, you know, if at some point, you know, spacecraft from multiple commercial vendors have to interact, you know, what are the standards? How are they specified for communication and traffic avoidance among those aircraft? And 
I think some of that work by the FAA and the, the people working on the ACAS-X project could certainly be very interesting in that area. So it's less of a ground-based support system for air traffic management or in our theoretical example, space traffic management. It's more just a way for individual craft to communicate to each other. So if, say, there's a the Bigelow Space Station in 2035 is a hub for commercial vendors, then those individual spacecraft could, in theory, talk to each other, and you almost have a a port of sorts that runs itself, utilizing the same computing language and uh, basically basic idea. Right. So that would be sort of a natural extension of the ACAS-X project. You know, the the problem that they're really trying to solve by using Julia is, you know, not really related to its performance aspects, but to its uh, to its productivity aspects. So, you know, it's it's very readable by humans. Um, so, you know, they can understand what's going on, but simultaneously, you know, it's a computing language, so they can run it and you know make sure that it's correct. And you know, some people have talked about actually taking the specification as is and running it on the actual aircraft in this case. Um, but just having you know a clear and well-defined specification and a specification that you can run you know, static analysis and other sorts of verification tools to make sure it's really, really correct because you know lives are on the line um, is you know, is is the idea behind that project? All right, that provides a much a much more robust model going forward. You know, for for modes of communic modes of transportation that we are already using as well. I mean, or, or at least it could. I mean, you talked about airplanes for one, but I mean, even just general traffic could could you know could benefit from that. The the, the whole notion of the self driving car once that market expands, I think all of those things could potentially benefit from something like this. Yeah, I think we'll see a lot of interest into you know, especially in safety critical systems. And you know, don't get me wrong, Julia at the moment is certainly not something that I would recommend. You know, write it in this language and put it into your safety critical system. But you know, <laughs> yeah. it's it's been used as a specification language, and people have thought about you know what does it take um, to eventually get there. So, you know, to any listeners, you know, if you're building a self-driving car uh, and, you know, for your safety critical system, don't choose Julia just now, <laughs> or at least talk to us first. Uh, you know, it, uh, it, it's certainly something that I could, you know, I could see it going there. Yeah, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, things are going to, I mean, we're, we're going to get to the point where you're going to want something a bit more uh robust and that can handle a significant amount of processing to do that kind of specification. And yeah, I could see that eventually down the road being the language to do it. So, And then, so in terms of, you, you mentioned processing power, I'm looking at NERSC and I'm looking at, you know, just a, a general understanding of supercomputers from a, a lay perspective. You know, one, wh- where on the, I guess, in the is NERSC within the top five or the top ten supercomputers in the world, and two, as we're talking about the further development of this technology, uh, is this something that could be run on on board on an autonomous vehicle or on a spacecraft? I mean, because when it comes to space specifically, you know, weight is key. You can't have. You, know, you can't launch an entire supercomputer up there. So if it can fit on, you know, on board a spacecraft and have all of these add all of these capabilities to the craft, is that possible under current constraints, technological constraints, or like what are the things that need to be developed later on to to make this more accessible to the commercial market? Yeah. So I'll let Prabhat take uh, the supercomputing question, but let me. Let me address the second question about, you know, can you actually take this kind of technology and put it on, you know, say a spacecraft? And I think that is sort of an underappreciated point of writing high performance code. Because, you know, high performance code in the modern world means taking very efficient advantage of the underlying hardware. And you know, we at the moment mostly care about it for, um, you know, getting the most bang for a buck. 
But on the other hand, it also means uh, taking less power and it means, you know, being able to get away with perhaps less powerful processors or radiation hardened processors um, that, you know, a, a slower program might not fit in or be in the right power envelope. And uh, another thing that we've seen with Julia is that we've had pretty good success ad uh, adapting it to new hardware architectures. So, you know, when you're, you're flying to space, you probably don't want to send your iPhone, but you know, you, you'll have a special, uh, special architecture um, that runs these programs. So again, not something for right now, but I think, I think in the future, that is something very interesting. Yeah, that's right. So maybe, you know, I'll, I'll uh, add uh, Jack in that. I think one has to be clear about exactly what the use case is. So uh, I think the in, quote unquote in situ deployment use case for Celeste would most likely be transient detection or a use case wherein after having detected an anomaly or a transient, uh, you want to schedule some follow-up time uh, in, in some distributed fashion. So I can imagine that with uh, the, the generative model that approach that we have, the moment LSST captures, uh, you know, systematically sweeping the nighttime sky and it flags Celeste running in situ at uh, a modest compute resource right next to um, LSST in Chile or wherever, um, flags some object as um, not belonging to the catalog. Um, so then that might uh, either ask the LSST to repeatedly image that part of the sky or send out a message to a spectroscopic instrument, some other part in the world, which can then conduct follow-up measurements. So really, I think there's a lot you can do with smarter, adaptive, more intelligent, ground-based astronomy. So uh, going going back to your question on uh, on uh, NERSC and, and supercomputing, um, so uh, the, the Cori system, which is the most powerful system that we have right now at NERSC, um, debuted at uh, number five on the top 500 list in 2016. So we were a, a part of the top 500 list, uh, uh, but now I think we've slipped down to number eight. So it's a, still a fairly powerful system. So it's about 14 uh, petaflops uh, double precision. And I'll note that the Celeste project was able to obtain 1.5 petaflops. Uh, you know, that 15 petaflop, 14 or 15 petaflop number that's reported uh, is, is a number that's obtained by the vendors. Uh, so uh, Cray, Intel, IBM, NVIDIA, so on and so forth. And they spend a lot of time in tuning uh, benchmarks and applications to obtain that number. And I would say that a relatively modest size team, uh, although I, I think an extremely effective team in Celeste, was able to get to a fairly high fraction of that number over a course of uh, uh, six months or so. So really, I think it is, uh, there's a lot of credit here for uh, the Julia programming language um, and Keno in particular, who was able to optimize uh, the code to run uh, on the entire Cori supercomputer and get a fairly significant level of performance. Great. And so you guys are still top 10, which is great. Yeah, that's right. Good. So, and, and so I guess for, for, for those who are listening who may not be familiar with supercomputers, what, I guess, you know, are there improvements you can make to that existing system? Or is it sort of you wait for the next best one to be built and then you just build a whole new one after that? Uh, so frankly, again, you know, we, we put out a state-of-the-art system. Uh, it costs a, a fair amount of money and we, we try to spend that money well and, and carefully. Uh, getting the software in shape is, is a big challenge. Uh, making sure that the stack is performant and, and productive is a big challenge. So we talked you know, all about that. Now, in terms of the next generation of machines, um, obviously storage is a, is a big concern. So right right now, uh, you know, we uh, you, you talked about the diversity in the data set, but then uh, one also has to think about once you place that diverse data set on a, on a file system, what do the access patterns look like? Are you doing random IO? Are you doing contiguous IO? What, what sort of IO is it? So uh, this, this particular project was quite challenging in that we were trying to load uh, hundreds of millions of files um, over a very short period of time. And uh, that certainly imposed a lot of metadata and data challenges on file systems. So we use something called the burst buffer, which is a big SSD pool of memory. Um, it's about 1.5 petabytes in size at NERSC, and we use that fairly effectively for handling the I.O. So going forward, I think uh, either uh, whatever the next generation of the burst buffer or a big SSD pool is going to look like is something that we will certainly hope to utilize. Uh, there is a question around uh, object stores and whether object store technologies will be ready in time for 
the next generation of Celeste, but we'll see you know, how that turns out. Um, now, assuming for a moment that the IO subsystem is appropriately resourced and configured, uh, the computing element, of course, is, is uh, uh, quite, quite a challenge. So right now, NERSC, um, the Celeste was essentially run on the Knight's Landing chip. Uh, so we ran 1.3 million threads on 650,000 Knight's Landing cores. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, uh, you know, NERSC will certainly is keeping track of trends in hardware, and uh, it remains is to be seen exactly uh, which flavor of machine we're going to deploy. But the trend, I would say, in supercomputing is definitely towards heterogeneous hardware. So um, uh, nodes consisting of CPUs and GPUs or CPUs and other accelerators are, are definitely, you know, technologies that we're tracking. So, uh, you know, if, say, um, GPUs or some other accelerators were to show up at, at uh, NERSC in the future, then uh, for the Celeste project, I think uh, there would be a question around, well, you know, we have this great Julia code base uh, that can effectively use uh, many core parallelism on nice landing. Can we now transparently utilize uh, GPUs or some, some other accelerator hardware? So I think that's something which, uh, you know, I would like Keno you know, to maybe share his thoughts on. Well, you're, you're in luck, Prabhat, on that one. Um, <laughs> we, we recently, um, well, it's been going on for a while, but I think it's just becoming ready is the GPU backend for, for Julia. So uh, Julia is, I think, one of the only um, programming languages that can natively compile to GPUs now. Um, you know, the traditional way you program GPUs is, again, you use sort of a vendor dialect of C or C++ or uh, Fortran even. Um, so if you're you know, talking NVIDIA, you're thinking CUDA. If you're talking AMD or Intel, you know, maybe maybe OpenCL or some of the uh, newer iterations of those standards. But what we've really tried to do is get Julia or at least, you know, a, as much of a subset of it as possible um, to natively compi compile down to GPUs. And I think it's not just GPUs. I think we're in a very interesting uh, moment in the history of computing right now. So, you know, if you're looking at single core performance, Moore's law has been dead, you know, for a number of years now. And we've about eight or 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> at this point. Yeah. And, and we, you know, the, the vendors have sort of been able to make up for it by, by sticking, sticking more and more cores on a die. Um, but now, you know, you're seeing some of the vendors have challenges with the process improvements that have sort of kept this uh, kept the scaling going. So what I'm seeing in the future is sort of a renewed push to look into, okay, what are the most efficient hardware abstractions um, that we can provide, you know, to pick up some of the slack uh, now that we're running into these fundamental physical limitations. And, you know, with those hardware abstractions, the software abstractions will have to change as well. So, you know, I, I certainly hope that Julia will be well positioned to take advantage of that. But, you know, frankly, I don't think anybody knows yet what, you know, the winning uh, approach to hardware will be in, say, 10, 20 years. Um, and then, so I guess for, for some maybe better understanding, Moore's Law, you mentioned that earlier. Could you give maybe a your 10-word answer? Yeah, so Moore's Law is basically, you know, this, uh, com uh, Moore's Law, when it was formulated said, you know, the transistor density uh, in chips doubles every 18 months. And for a long time, that, you know, meant that, you know, every 18 months, you know, your computer was twice as fast. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, on single core performance, that hasn't been true for a while. So, you know, even say, you know, 15 years ago, if you went, you know, down to your local computer store, after, after two years and bought a, bought a new computer, it would be significantly faster. Um, that's no longer true. It is still true that the transistor densities are currently you know, going up, so they're fitting more and more you know, different functions and compute units on a given chip. So you know, if you go to Intel and say, hey, give me the most compute you have, you'll get one of the Knight's nice landing chips that we used in the private mentioned, which has uh, 70 cores 
on a single silicon die. So, you know, for comparison, in you know your standard laptop, you might have four. But you know, you, you go to Intel and you get 70 cores, they're not as good or as fast as the one that in your laptop, but it's easier to put more slower cores on a die than, than fewer fast ones. And this has to do with sort of fundamental limitations of physics. So the way that Moore's law has basically sustained what is that you know the the hardware vendors have made improvements to the way they manufacture these chips, you know, going to smaller and smaller features, but you know, eventually you run into physical limitations. So the uh, the way it's manufactured is that they you know shine shine light on it and then etch away the unexposed areas. There you run into limitations about the wavelength of the light. Um, you can't really you know image patterns smaller than the wavelength. There's a couple of very cool techniques for you know despite uh, the wavelength, you just illuminate it multiple times and and alternate. It's uh, it, it, it's all very clever, but it, it it becomes more expensive and eventually unfeasible. And you know there's uh, still ideas in the semiconductor industry for how to go beyond this, but I think it is a very fair statement that it's getting harder and harder, you know, to just rely on, uh, to, to overcome physics uh, to make better devices. And, you know, when, when your power against physics diminishes, you have to start being more clever. And I think there's a lot of room for being clever in hardware design, uh, just as this, I think there's still a lot of room for being clever in software design you know, in order to most efficiently solve whatever problem you're currently having. So work smarter, not harder. That's right. Because you can work harder because physics won't let you. That darn physics. If only Newton hadn't uh, dis- uh, discovered it. Not you, Newton. The other one. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you know we're, we're just over an hour and five minutes into our, our episode. So I kind of wanted to go into maybe some final thoughts on where you see the next major development for Julia, when we might you know, expect the next, uh, the next major Celeste project announcement, or just in general, what you're looking forward to when it comes to cosmology uh, or astronomy research. You can answer one, two, or all three of them, up to you. All right, so I'll, let me uh, start with Julia and then... Um, take some of the computing sides of Celeste, and then I'll let Prabhat get into the science side of Celeste. So uh, on Julia, you know, I'm not sure this was mentioned, but Julia is actually a relatively young project as far as programming languages go. So, you know, Julia has only been around since about 2009, so less than 10 years compared to, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years for some other programming languages. Um, And we're just this year coming up on the uh, 1.0 long-term stable release um, of Julia. So sort of the, the release that we're, we're proud to call, you know, um, to call Julia for, for an extended period of time. So that will be released within the next couple of months. And it's, it's really shaping up to be, to be a great release. And it actually has some of the learnings uh, from uh, the experience of running on the supercomputer um, that we made last year with the with the Celeste project, so that's coming up. You know, lots of great features in there. As I mentioned, we'll have GPU support. Um, you know, the ecosystem for working with data has been significantly cleaned up. There's some very very exciting things happening on machine learning um, in pure Julia. So bringing the advantages that Julia has into machine learning and deep learning and AI in general. Uh, so, so that I find, uh, so that I think is the most exciting things on the Julia side. On the Celeste side, from the computing perspective, um, I think there's a, a couple of very interesting challenges that we didn't get to um, while you know attempting uh, to get it to run on the supercomputer. Um, so one thing, of course, you know, as Prabhat mentioned, um, Corey is a is a 15 petaflop class machine. We got 1.5, which is you know pretty good for the one month of tuning work that we put in. But I certainly think it should be possible, you know, to to reach that to reach that 15, or maybe at, at least to 10. So I, I think um, I think that would be something very interesting on the computing side. 
Uh, as Prabhat mentioned, GPUs are a big topic, and now that, GP, uh, that Julia has excellent GPU capabilities, I think it would be very interesting to try to get uh, Celeste running on GPUs and see if we can take advantage of those as well. Um, and then uh, lastly, I think one thing that we left mostly unexplored is um, to better manage the mass of data that we have. So Celeste had a massive challenge in moving all this data uh, from storage to the compute nodes. And you know, we were just barely able to uh, squeak by you know, on the fifth best supercomputer getting all this data to the compute fast enough, right? And this was sort of the smallest of the astronomical data sets that Celeste could, you know, potentially analyze. And, you know, it's, it's not LSST scale. So I think, you know, being a lot smarter about how do you move the data from the, um, from the storage to the compute nodes, you know, uh, we have to load data multiple times to processes on different nodes uh, to refine our estimates. So, you know, can we come up with a smart strategy to pre-stage the data in memory on the nodes and move it over the network? You know, I think there's, there's some very interesting compute challenges still in Celeste. You're, you're talking about the spatial complexity of your algorithms in, in a lot of cases, right? That's Making right. sure that those are reduced yeah. sufficiently. And with that, I'll turn it over to Prabhat. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's a great, uh, I think, summary of uh, <clears throat> the technology and computer science issues. Maybe just uh, backing up to statistics and science. Um, you know, I think we definitely want to do the joint inference across multiple data sets. So, you know, again, we processed SDSS, but we want to process multiple telescope data and then um, uh, produce a catalog. So, uh, you know, Keno uh, alluded that to, to the fact that Corey has a lot of compute horsepower. So if you're going to process, say, uh, hundreds of terabytes of raw data or maybe maybe a petabyte, uh, you will certainly need to keep that supercomputer busy for a long time. Uh, so I think that's something that we are looking forward to. Now, as an artifact of, of such runs, uh, the fundamental product is a catalog. So it's a list of objects. And if you think about it as computer scientists, I mean, when we write papers, um, you would be lucky if you have, say, a thousand citations for your paper. Um, but, a, but a catalog is referenced by th tens of thousands of astronomers. So, so I think in terms of the outreach and the impact, the measurable impact on, on the field of astronomy and potentially cosmology, I think the catalog is the big goal. Um, so I think we're certainly looking forward to publishing this catalog and uh, sharing it with the rest of the astronomy community and publicizing that. So I think that should uh, happen in, in the next year or so. Uh, finally, um, um, AI and, and deep learning are obviously extremely hot at this point in time. And I think we have empirical evidence that uh, deep learning can help improve the Celeste st uh, statistical model. So that's one of the things that we are looking forward to, uh, selectively bringing in autoencoders or some other advanced architectures and plugging them in this generative model uh, to further improve the accuracy of uh, the Celeste um, uh, you know, statistical procedure. So I think those are the, uh, the goals. And you know, we're certainly looking forward to sharing. I think any, any uh, interesting updates uh, uh, you know, with, with you and, and your uh, listener community in, in the future. Great. Yeah, and when we'll we'll be happy to host you guys when you have the next uh, major announcement for Celeste Project. Sounds great. So I I think that should be the end of our conversation here. It was great talking to both of you. I hope you know I know you're up in Massachusetts, so it might not be warm there. But Prabhat, I I think it's maybe a little bit warmer in California than it is here in the East Coast. It certainly is. Newton, do you have any other uh, interesting tidbits you want to let us know about? Uh, any coming soon to space? Uh, actually, actually, I've got nothing this week. So, um, But thank you guys very much. Once again, it was a great conversation to be had. And uh, yeah, everyone tune in to the Celeste Project and try downloading the, the Julia Computing programming language. <laughs> It'll probably take you a little bit longer than 15 minutes to catalog all 188 million <laughs> stars, galaxies, planets, all that. On my laptop, sure. <laughs> you can probably do 10 of them in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, thank you guys for for joining us. Be sure to to tune in to next week's episode. And if you haven't gotten your official Ad Astra t-shirt, be sure to go to elemental.fm slash Ad Astra shirt. That's elemental.fm slash Ad Astra shirt. If you have any comments, questions, or specific inquiries that you want us to talk about on the next episode, feel free to leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Carrier Pigeon, you know, <laughs> however you can get some, some information to us about what you want us to talk about get it to us. <laughs> thanks very much for the opportunity, Jack and Newton. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. Well, as always, I'm your host, Jack. And I'm Newton. At Astra. Astra.